Thank you for everyone for coming to today's CPP talk. And today's CPP talk is uh, actually led by myself uh, oh, uh, and uh, Andy Barrett and Jessica Vover. So it's about the Arctic rain on snow study. This is a part of what's called the navigating the new Arctic. We're only gonna focus on a piece of this, which is the physical science part of this. I'll tell you a little bit more about the project in a minute. Uh, so I'm Mark Cerez. Um, I'm actually the director of the National Snow and Ice Center. But despite the burdens that come with that office, um, I also have time to actually do some real research, such as you see here. And in fact, I'm going to Alaska tomorrow to do some permafrost work. So some real research as well. Uh, now, uh, also, we've got Andy Barrett. Andy's part of this project. Uh, Andy's been with NSIDC a long, long time. Uh, we've worked on many different studies. Uh, uh, Andy does a lot of work on uh, remote sensing, uh, looking at atmospheric reanalysis data. And Jessica Volveris, uh, she's a grad student here. Uh, she got her degree from Oklahoma and was an operational meteorologist for NOAA. Uh, which fits in perfectly well uh, with this season, but now she's back here at the University of Colorado working with me on this project. So Jessica, if you could please advance the slides. So what I'm going to start with, first of all, is to listen to a little overview of the project. I'll give you that, and then we're going to turn it over to Jessica. She's our resident meteorologist, and she'll start talking about the meteorology of some of these rain on snow events. Another big part of this Arctic rain on snow study is event detection using a number of different data sources. And so we're gonna go be sort of tag teaming, well, not exactly, we are tag teaming this particular talk. So again, Jessica, if you could go on. Well, what are we talking about? Rain on snow events. What they really are, there's a problem of growing concern in the north. This little schematic kind of illustrates what's going on. We think about the Arctic and it's got snow for most of the year, right? During the cold season. Well, what, is hap what happens sometimes is you get a warm incursion of air, a warm, moist air. And so you get a rain event on top of the snow. Now that itself can cause things like slush avalanches, many different things, increased uh, risk of flooding. And I'm trying to show that on the top panel. But then what quite often happens is that that rainfall is followed by a rapid drop in temperatures. It gets cold. And so water freezes uh, on the snow on the surface or on the ground or as layers within the snow. It releases latent heat as it freezes, of course, that can warm the snow, even the underlying permafrost at times. Uh, but then it remains cold. Now, one of the issues here is that when we get these ice layers forming at the surface or on the ground or in the snow, uh, it can block animals from foraging. So one of the big challenges or issues of these rain on snow events is that they've been associated with like massive die-offs of reindeer, which are basically just domesticated caribou, caribou, musk oxen, and other animals. This can also interfere with things like seal denning or a polar bear denning on land. So if we could go on again, uh, Jessica, uh, here's just an example. Uh, this is actually showing two different ice layers that were formed from two different rain on snow events. Uh, this was in the Yamal Peninsula. Uh, so you can see at the bottom there, there's the tundra vegetation, a first ice layer from one rain on snow event, a second ice layer on top of that, and you can see some reindeer uh, on the top. Uh, so uh, that's kind of, you know, just a, an example of what this sort of thing looks like. But of course, you can have icy layers on the top. What happened with that second ice layer, for example, it formed from a rain on snow event, and then more snow fell on the top. Same thing with that first ice layer. So we could again go on, uh, Jessica. And I mentioned one of the outcomes of this is that these rain on snow events have been associated with uh, big die-offs of, of reindeer, of course, which are domesticated uh, caribou, caribou themselves. Uh, there was an event on Banks Island, for example, some years ago that resulted in the death of 20,000 muskox. 
Now, the uh, problems or the challenges of these, these die-outs, they can occur quickly or the effects can unfold for many years. And these events are being, having great challenges to reindeer herding communities. And that was one of the major drivers of this project. So we can go on again, Jessica. Just the overview here, this rain on snow study that I talk about, we call it AROS. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to understand the causes, frequency, and severity of these rain on snow events, as well as just extreme precipitation events in a warming Arctic. One of the issues here is as the Arctic warms up, we could be having more rain on snow events, more severe rain on snow events. We're very interested in impacts on reindeer herding, wildlife, tundra, and impacts on indigenous communities. Now, the issue here we're talking about today, really the physical aspects of these rain on snow events, and this is just a part of this larger AROS study. So we're just focusing today on the physical aspects. What are the observing assets that we've got to detect rain on snow events, hopefully map them across the entire Arctic landscape for several decades. Atmospheric reanalyses, which a number of you are familiar with, such as the ERA-5 effort. Climate model output, like from the CMIP-6 study, as you know, the latest IPCC assessment just came out and was using these models to make projections and we use them to study rain on snow changes in the future. Satellite uh, uh, data, uh, the SIMR SSMI series, also, we're going to be using, we hopefully, active microwave data, that's radar. Validation data from meteorological stations, from the Mosaic expedition. Actually, we're writing a paper now about a rain on snow event that was observed during the Mosaic expedition. Also, local observer networks, like reindeer herders in Alaska, Finland and Russia, hunters in Canada, something called the LEO network that we make of. So what are we trying to get out of this? And just the physical science, right? A detection algorithm, a way that we can detect these events across the Arctic landscape and look at the severity of them and are they changing? Also expert system models to explore some of the social ecological impacts of rain on snow. And so with that, what we're gonna talk about now, and I'm passing it over to Jessica, is some of the meteorology of these events. How do they actually come about? So Jessica, you have the virtual podium. All right, thanks, Mark. <laughs> As Mark mentioned, I'm uh, Jessica Valveras. I'm a graduate student here at CU in the geography department. Um, you may have seen my picture pop up on a Zoom meeting here or there. So I'm still trying to get my bearings and getting to know people. So um, it's actually second week I've been back in the building. So this is uh, this is great. So as Mark mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the meteorology that's involved with uh, a lot of these events and driving some of these events. Um, so looking at past meteorological studies, we have this one from Rennert et al. 2009, who kind of went into the synoptic climatology of uh, two specific Ross events, the Banks Island Canada event that Mark mentioned, and then also a uh, Ross event in Svalbard in 1995, and Svalbard is actually a location that probably sees quite a few Ross events, as I'll go into another one a little bit later. Um, but what these studies kind of uh, noticed was they raised the importance of these strong anti-cyclones, these, these ridges of high pressure, um, and you can kind of see in the image here on the left, the example side, the right-hand side, um, we've got a pretty strong ridge of high pressure there across Western Canada, so that's the one for the Banks Island event in October 2003, and then also a little bit of a ridge across the North Atlantic there that's influencing that Svalbard event. Um, so what you get with these ridges of high pressure is you get very strong um, warm southerly flow. We call it warm air advection uh, in the meteorology realm, or you can have onshore flow for uh, more maritime areas. So that's basically warm and also very moist air that comes into these locations. And so subsequently, um, this type of air mass leads to anomalously high temperatures in the area and then also high moisture transport in some of these cases. Um, the other issue is there... Um, occurring at weird times of the year, basically. Um, so fall to early spring, we're typically seeing a lot of the precipitation in the Arctic transition to solid form because we're losing, we're losing daylight, we're losing solar radiation. So we should be seeing temperatures um, remaining below freezing through much of this time period. But um, these events are causing enough of a warm air incursion 
um, to melt this precipitation before it reaches the surface. So um, a lot of these solid studies acknowledge that there's more research that needs to be done both at the synoptic level, so large scale planetary wave level, um, but then also more uh, localized effects uh, that should be taken into account. So uh, the Banks Island Canada event, for example, uh, the two key elements that we've got here, again, are the uh, increased moisture that we see coming into some of these regions, um, and then the anomalously high uh, temperatures that we're seeing with some of these events. So the top panel here is precipitable water, um, and that is if you were to take a column of the entire atmosphere and have all of that liquid precipitated out, that's how much liquid you would generate. So normal for this time of year for Banks Island would be around uh, six millimeters, but you can see in the panel at the top, um, we've got uh, periods of the time that uh, it reaches up to about 15, even 20 millimeters of water, of precipitable water. So a lot of moisture with this. And then also the anomalously high temperatures, which the bottom panel kind of shows um, in the range of about 10 to 15 uh, above normal for this time of year. So in addition to kind of exploring the meteorological variables um, with these events, I'm also trying to look at uh, if there's links to blocking patterns and then also atmospheric river development with that. Um, so when we talk about blocking patterns in meteorology, that's we're seeing a disruption in the jet stream. And so you're not seeing the normal progression of west to east moving waves or, or storm systems, basically. There's some sort of disturbance that's kind of blocking that normal flow. Um, and two sort of normal types we kind of see in the operational meteorology realm is the omega block, which is the top left image here. And it's basically exactly like it sounds. It's a capital Greek omega. You can kind of see how my cursor outlines the, the ridge being the high point. And then we've got usually two cutoff lows that are kind of squeezing that ridge between there. And then the second type of blocking pattern, which is the one on the right, which is called a Rex block or a dipole block, where we have a pretty strong high over a low, um, can sometimes be, actually, it's usually a, probably a cutoff low in that case too. Um, and then obviously you see warmer, drier conditions where the ridges are positioned and then a little more uh, maybe unsettled weather where the lows are. Um, and a lot of studies in recent years have kind of made this connection between these blocking patterns and then also atmospheric river development. So when you have this ridge that kind of stays over a region for a long period of time, you get a nice gradient buildup between it and the low, generally the low to the west. Um, so if we were looking at the omega block here, um, it would kind of be this gradient right here through the uh, Pacific Northwest states that we would look at um, for atmospheric river development. So um, part of my research uh, consists of using atmospheric reanalysis data. Um, so this was for a uh, Ross event in Western Greenland um, in April 2016. There's actually a great paper that talks about the slush avalanche uh, aspect that came with this, but um, I wanted to go a little bit more into the meteorology side of things. So this is looking at 250 millibar geopotential height. Um, so this is the jet stream level, very high up in the atmosphere. And when we talk about geopotential height, it's the height in meters that that pressure level falls at. Um, so this is a great level where we can see troughs and ridges that are kind of influencing different uh, weather patterns across the globe. Um, so in this case, we've got a very strong ridge across Southern Greenland. Um, we've got a pretty broad trough across Northern Canada. So those lower heights there. Um, and then a little bit of a cutoff low across Western Europe. Um, so what we've got just by looking at this is uh, pretty much an omega block in this case. Um, and then moving a little bit lower in the atmosphere, so the 500 millibar uh, geopotential height, still upper levels, but just a little bit below the 500 or the 250 millibar. Um, this is showing heights and then wind speeds, uh, so ice attacks. And uh, what we've got is that gradient that sets up between that trough across northern Canada and the ridge across Greenland. And we actually have winds in excess of like 90 knots. Um, through that region. So, and again, you also have to look at where the winds are coming from. So as it rounds that trough, they're coming from out of the south uh, and then southwest as you hit more into Greenland. So the air mass that that's coming from is very warm and very moist since that's the North Atlantic. So we're pulling in a lot of very warm, uh, moist air across Western Greenland. So looking a little bit lower, 850 millibars, We've got temperatures and then also relative humidity overlaid on this uh, graph as well. So the cool thing you kind of get with this is we can see a huge fetch of moisture 
um, even off the chart of where uh, the source is with that. So we know it's um, very moist since it's coming out of the North Atlantic there. Um, and then we've also got the isotherms, um, which are in red. Those are the temperature bars. And I only had them plot greater than zero degrees Celsius so we could really see where the warm air um, was coming in right there across Western Greenland. So very interesting um, stuff happening with this case. And then in addition, as Mark mentioned, we can use uh, surface observations to kind of get an idea of what's going on um, in the really lower levels so that the surface um, so this was kind of a code I put together to show the Godfab station observations um, kind of during that event. Um, April 11th was the day we had the most precipitation at this location. And then um, we kind of see the precipitation persist throughout this period. But um, what's interesting is on the 11th, we see the temperature shoot up actually past 60 degrees. Um, so very strong warm air advection going on with this. Um, and then we also have liquid precip during that time. So that's the weather code observations on the bottom chart here. Um, we start to see temperature kind of drop off in about a day. And then we see the transition to more solid and mixed precip type mix being either freezing rain or rain on snow or rain and snow type of um, conditions here. And then a little bit of a blip higher in temperature, but then we really see those temperatures drop off like Mark was mentioning um, really qu quickly. Um, after the event. So in addition to uh, precip transitioning back to mixed and solid, um, it's giving the, the liquid that fell in the past few days a chance to really freeze over. So um, in addition to surface observations, I'm also uh, using upper air data with some of my research. Um, it's a favorite tool for forecasters. So uh, it really makes me happy that I can dive right back into um, stuff like this. So um, Basically, the way these work is if you've seen weather balloons, this is kind of the data that we get from this. It's uh, temperature and dew point and then wind direction and speed uh, plotted with height. Um, so it's also recording pressure. Pressure is on the left and it's actually plotted logarithmically, which is why we get these um, temperature lines that are skewed. So another name for this chart is a skew T graph. Um, but the, the nice thing about these is we can really see what's going on um, through the entire atmosphere, both for um, temperature behavior and then also for winds. Um, so on the chart here on the left that I've kind of highlighted in this oval, um, what's really pronounced is that warm nose. We call it a warm nose, but that's that warm air intrusion that we're seeing that's melting a lot of this precip. Um, and this is actually for Narsar Suak. I think I have that name right. I apologize if I don't. <laughs> um, so Gothab, which I pulled the station observations from, does not have an upper air data site. So I had to use two different sites. But um, it gives us a really interesting picture because uh, the Narsar Suak station is likely ahead of that, uh, basically the atmospheric river that we kind of saw in the reanalysis. So um, we've still got that warm nose though. And then this is probably a sounding for drizzle as opposed to heavier rain precipitation since um, we do have a little bit of moisture in this, in this sounding. Um, but a little bit of drier in the mid-levels. So this is probably more drizzle as opposed to actual rain. Um, and then instead of like looking at the winds via the wind barbs on the right here, which can get a little confusing, um, we can actually plot it in what's called a hodograph. Um, so this is the winds plotted in vector format um, using polar coordinates. So in this case, each of these radials is uh, 20 knots. So the next one would be 40. Um, so we've got decent wind out of the south, basically. So that's how this uh, kind of works is you start from the center and go out. So we know the wind is coming from the south, blowing north. Um, so that's kind of how we work in meteorology. Um, and then the other aspect we can see is we do have veering with height. So the winds kind of turn clockwise with height. I know it's kind of hard to see in that one, but um, that is indicative of warm air infection going on. So as I mentioned, we can also pull that Asiat sounding, um, which is to the north of Gothab, and that's actually right in line with those higher wind speeds that we saw on the 500 millibar chart. Um, and we can really see that too in the wind profile, much stronger winds. This is actually probably about 100 knots in the upper levels that we're seeing. Um, and then also we've got the same veering with height, so winds are turning clockwise with height. Um, so we know that's very strong warm air infection, and we also know most of the winds are out of the southwest in that case. So very warm, very moist flow coming into this station. Um, and then again, similar to the last sounding we saw, we've got that very pronounced warm nose right at the surface in the lower levels. So that's enough to melt the precipitation down to a liquid form, um, since I've highlighted the freezing line there in blue. Um, and then most of the rest of the column is saturated. So this is probably heavier precipitation we're seeing at that location. 
So this one is five days after the event, and this is Narsar Suak. So again, that's the southern tip of Greenland. Um, what's the big thing that you can kind of see is the change in the wind behavior. Um, different air mass that's kind of pushing in. So it's likely probably the trough that's pushing the ridge out, the trough that was over northern Canada, kind of making its way in. Um, so we have winds more out of the northeast in the lower levels and then more west southwesterly aloft. So um, what we see is colder, drier air kind of moving in on this station. And we see that in the skew T on the left where um, everything is pretty much below freezing um, through the entire uh, profile here. And then also drier air, you can see the air temperature not matching the dew point anymore. Um, another interesting aspect is um, the uh, tropopause kind of coming down a little bit. So when I say that, that's that's this area right here with my cursor where we see the winds that are the temperatures increasing with height. Um, so that's actually come down quite a bit from the uh, last few days. And actually moving on to the Asiat sounding data, you can see it's even much, much lower. So this is actually probably uh, pretty close to the center of the trough because what we see is the wind speeds actually back off a lot. Um, on the photograph here, it, uh, the, each of the radials is actually only 10 knots this time. So we really don't see wind speeds greater than 30 knots throughout the entire profile. So winds have relaxed quite a bit. It's also a different air mass that's coming in. You can see much colder temperatures. Um, and then also the uh, moisture comes down quite a bit with the sounding too. And again, this is five days after the event. So that's probably driving those cooler temperatures that are coming in and, and allowing that liquid precip to freeze over top. So as I mentioned, um, Svalbard kind of sees a uh, little more Ross events. Um, and then this one from 2012 was pretty impactful. Um, both Annie and Mark wrote a couple of papers on this, I believe. We actually had the highest recorded precipitation event at Nye Elisund, which was about 98 millimeters on the 30th of January. Um, so it's a pretty significant event. And you can see similar to the Banks Island um, panel I showed earlier, we've got the two key elements here, which is the increase in moisture on the top panel, the higher precipitable water amounts, um, and then actually much, much higher, uh, anomalously higher temperatures on the bottom. So similarly, I pulled observation data from Svalbard and we're kind of seeing the same things that we saw with the uh, Greenland events. Um, so on the 29th of January, where my cursor's at, we have that increased warm air infection, pushing the temperature up to about 40 degrees. Um, we also see the liquid precip observations that we're getting during that time period through the 31st. Um, and then we kind of see this, this temperature bouncing back and forth. Um, so we're getting solid to mixed precipitation type through that period of about two days. And then after about February 2nd, um, we see those temperatures really fall and uh, most of the precipitation is solid at this point. And then on the sounding side, similar kind of characteristics we're seeing with um, this event as well. Uh, I highlighted a couple of places on this QT to, to uh, really show what the big things that we're kind of looking out for. Um, so the blue circle, again, we've got that nice warm nose, not as pronounced as the Greenland event, but still just enough to, to melt the precip down to liquid. Um, the saturated atmospheric profile, so that's um, air temperature matching the dew point all the way up to about 600 millibars, so pretty moist. And then um, the wind behavior as well. We've got onshore flow that's southwesterly as those, as those vectors are kind of pointing. Um, so again, very warm, very moist air coming out of the North Atlantic for Svalbard. And then of course, four days after the event, different behavior with the winds. We see more northeasterly flow um, in this sounding in the uh, low and the mid levels. So colder, drier air coming in. And we kind of see that react in the skew T with um, much, much colder temperatures coming in. And then also a uh, very dry air mass also with that. So with that, I will turn it over to Andy. Thank you, Jessica. Um, so it's now up to me to, uh, to talk about um, event detection. And this is a, a key uh, component of, of the project. Um, it's also a, a work in progress. Um, so I'm going to be talking more about the, uh, the data that we're going to be using for the event detection and then give you a, a roadmap for, the, uh, for our detection algorithm. So next slide, please, Jessica. Okay, um, so Jessica gave a really nice introduction to, to some of the data sets that are available, um, the surface observations in the upper air, as well as, well as the, the reanalysis data. Um, and 
this the, is the surface uh, meteorological observations that, that really kind of form the uh, the input to to uh, any detection algorithm um, here because those are the uh, the stations that are giving us information about precipitation type. Um, the plot I'm showing here is is really summarizes a lot of the work that Jessica has been doing over the past few months, which is is pulling um, meteorological station data and upper air data um, all over the Arctic. Um, from and we're focusing at the moment on on automated uh, weather stations, uh, the ASOS system uh, within the US, um, and that acronym is, is generally used to describe some of the other automated stations uh, throughout the rest of the Arctic. Um, and these stations not only give us information about temperature and and precipitation amount, dew point. Um, but they also contain uh, present weather codes, and you saw some of those plotted on some of the uh, some of the plots that Jessica just showed. And those present weather codes, amongst other things, tell us precipitation type. And it might say whether the precipitation is rain, whether it's freezing rain, snow, ice pellets. So it gives us an idea of the type of precipitation that is falling at a point. Um, and sometimes that is based on automated uh, instruments, um, and, and other times that's information that has been entered by human observers, whether a human observers uh, at, at the stations. The challenge here is that these weather stations only see the weather above the station. Um, they're not telling us anything about um, the, the weather over, over a larger area. Um, and as you can see from the map, um, there's a very uneven distribution um, of stations. It's pretty sparse. There's greater density over Alaska and also over Scandinavia, but we have very little information over um, uh, Russia and, and e even over Canada and, and certainly not Greenland. And, and many of the stations are also coastal. Um, so this is, what we have to work with but what we want to end up with is a inventory of rain on snow events for the whole of the arctic and so these stations provide the initial information that we're going to use in order to train our detection algorithm but then we're going to apply that to reanalysis data and the reanalysis data provide upper air information um, of a similar type to, to what's available um, from, from the upper air stations, but it's model output um, and, and also whether it's precipitating or not. So we can then use that train. Our idea is to train a machine learning model that will allow us to detect rain or winter rain, liquid precipitation within the, uh, within the reanalysis data. Next slide, please. So this is just an example of um, days with um, what I'm calling here winter rain, but it's essentially liquid precipitation um, that falls between September and April um, for five um, stations within the uh, Canadian um, network, um, showing Ecolute, Clyde River, Hall Beach, Resolute, and Baker Lake. Um, and what I've done here is to look at days that have record either rain, freezing rain, or, or rain showers. Um, those are the weather codes that they that they give. And you can see that we have you know, some winter rain falling in 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 all years. Um, some stations are certainly having having more of these occurrences. Um, we're looking at September to April, so it's kind of moving into into what you might consider that the, the shoulder months if you start looking at a smaller period then uh, obviously the the number of uh, winter rain events drops off most the months which see the most of these events is actually october and, and april with more occurring in october so it gives you some idea of, of the number of events we, we have to work with um, for for training any algorithm that we're going to use okay next slide please jessica so, 
An additional piece of information we have, and Mark mentioned this, is uh, local observer networks. Um, and this might be uh, reindeer herding associations, hunters, um, and, and also uh, we're working with the LEO network from the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium, um, who collect a lot of local observations of not just rain on snow events, but a lot of other environmental um, phenomena um, th throughout the Arctic and, and at lower latitudes as well, um, and then archive those. So they're observations by local observers, but also um, stories that occur in, in, in local media. Um, and they, they have web crawlers that, that go out and find stories that feature keywords associated um, with, with environmental events in, in, in the Arctic. Um, this, and what we've done within the uh, Rain on Snow project is to produce a, uh, a map of just Rain on Snow events, which we pull from the LEO network um, servers. Um, this was work done by, initially, put together by Mike Brubaker, but, but Matt Fisher um, here at NSIDC um, produced, produced the map. And you can find that on our Rain on Snow website, um, allows you to click on each of these symbols and find stories. So next slide, please. So we're not just interested in whether um, precipitation is, is falling in a, in a, a liquid or, or freezing form, um we're interested in how that impacts the the snowpack um and in order to get at that um without having boots on the ground um we need to rely on on remote sensing data and in particular um microwave remote sensing data um and the reason this is useful is that um microwaves uh the emissivity in in the microwave uh frequencies um has a big difference between dry snow and and wet snow um and so you can see see that signal it also allows you to see any changes within the snowpack structure um what i'm showing here is a couple of plots from a paper by uh, grenville and putkonin um which look at uh passive microwave um data from the ssmi sensor um, during a, a rain or snow event at Banks Island um, during October 2003. Um, the top panels are showing uh, brightness temperatures from, from the SSMI uh, for vertical and horizontal polarized uh, channels in 19 and 37 gigahertz. Um, and those are for two seasons um, from October. August to, through to uh, to August two years later, um, the first seasonal cycle, um, which you can see is cold condition labeled cold conditions with uh, non rain on snow, um, did not have a rain on snow event. The second season um, is is after that rain on snow event in in the October, and you can see nice seasonal cycles in in brightness temperatures related to both. Uh, changes in moisture conditions from uh, in the in the tundra, but also changes in in, in surface temperature, um, moving into a melt phase um, with some freeze thaw cycles, and that all looks uh, pretty pretty smooth in in the first season. But then, in October of the second season, there's this rain or snow event, and that introduces liquid water into into the snowpack. Um, reducing the emissivity of, of, of the snowpack, which is, you see, especially in the 19 gigahertz channel, a drop in brightness temperatures. And then the freezing temperatures come back in, causing, causing that liquid water to freeze, actually caused um, a few, several centimeter thick uh, layer of ice at the base of the snowpack. Um, and you move into a, a further seasonal cycle in, in the brightness temperatures, but there are key differences between what happened then to the previous year. In the 19 gigahertz channel, you see um, a larger difference between the vertical and horizontally, horizontally polarized um, brightness temperatures. Within the 37 gigahertz, you see a lot lower um, brightness temperatures um, with, from, from the snowpack. And we can get at that in a more quantitative way um, if we look at, uh, at gradient ratios and polarization ratios. That's what's being shown in the middle um, two, two plots. Um, 
and gradient ratio is in this case we're showing for vertically polarized channels it's the difference between 37 and 19 gigahertz channels shown as a normalized difference the polarization ratio it here for the 19 gigahertz channel is the difference between horizontally and or vertically and horizontally uh, polarized channels and you can see again stark differences between the gradient ratios after the rain on snow event went by comparison with the, with the uh, previous season with no rain on snow um, gradient ratios are much lower after the rain on snow event um, and a little higher um, for polarization radiation ratios there is when you look at that in in the gradient polarization ratio phase space um, again you can see clear distinction between uh, the cold season after the rain on snow and the cold season without the rain on snow and again you can see that as well how the impact that the liquid layer has so we can use this um, and other people have developed uh, detection algorithms um, to allow um, us to detect rain on snow events or changes in the snowpack due to liquid water. Um, and they've done this quite successfully with passive microwave, and it can also be done with, with active microwave. So next slide, please. And here's an example uh, from Annette Barsh uh, showing uh, a mapping of event frequency using active microwave KU band quick scat um, data. Um, and you can see the distribution of, of, of event frequency. Um, and you can see Iceland has, has quite a lot of events. Again, um, Western Europe also has, has quite, a, quite a few events. Um, our challenge here is that we're not, we're trying to combine both the information about precipitation type with the impacts that it has on 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 the snowpack um so uh next slide actually we can skip that and move on to the final slide okay so this is this kind of outlines our event detection algorithm um the idea is we want to use reanalysis and upper air and reanalysis upper air and surface surface fields as the input to our model we are also going to use passive and act active microwave data to come uh, as as input as well um, and then the surface meteorological observations um, help us identify the the rain on snow events we can build up a database um, of of observed rain on snow events and then feed that into some machine learning um, algorithm at the moment uh we're, we're working with the uh, random forest classifiers um these are essentially an ensemble learning approach to decision trees um, and the reason you want to use an ensemble of decision trees is to avoid uh over over training your your data set or your your model um so rather than just saying oh we've got one decision tree that performs really well um we're gonna produce an ensemble of decision trees and then use the information from those ensemble uh that ensemble to to come up with with detection um this has been done for for mid-latitude um uh, precipitation uh classification um by a team uh, led by amy mcgovern um at oklahoma um and this is comparing uh precipitation classification from the the RAP model, which is a, a numerical weather numerical weather prediction model, um, which has a heuristic classifier. Um, and this, we're, they're comparing this against uh, a random forest classifier applied to data from the uh, from the RAP model. And you can see there is a significant improvement in in uh, the skill of, of the random forest classifier over, over the over the the heuristic uh, classifier um, that's that's part of the model, um, and the the largest gains in in model performance is it comes with uh, looking at freezing rain and and ice pellets, but the, there is this overall performance. So that's where we're hoping to go. Um, obviously, 
how things apply to the the an Arctic situation may be different from uh, from a uh, mid latitude precipitation or situation. So uh, we we need to uh, maybe use different variables and and certainly a different model in order to do this. But but we hope that we'll have as as much uh, um, success uh, with using uh, this approach um, in the in the Arctic as they do it mid latitudes. So with that, I'll finish and say um, any questions. Questions from anyone you can, uh, I think you can just shout them out or put them in chat. I have one, um, Jessica, I'm not sure that you really um, define what you mean by an atmospheric river. It's like the Mississippi River or something. I thought rivers were on the ground. Okay. Yep. Good, good, good. Uh, yes, I did miss that. So um, let me go back to the Greenland example. Um, when we talk about an atmospheric river, um, some folks might be familiar with like the Pineapple Express term for California, because California usually sees a lot, a lot of atmospheric river uh, activity, basically. Um, it is basically just a long, usually narrow stream of moisture, uh, enhanced moisture, um, that just, it, it meanders in the atmosphere kind of like a river. And a lot of them usually have sources uh, all the way down into the tropics. Like uh, on this Greenland example, um, I, I should have done a little bit bigger picture to maybe see where that uh, moisture is coming from, but um, it is definitely uh, from a warmer and more moist source. So it's, it's uh, pulling in that. And, and these, are, these are things we have to watch for enhanced precipitation areas. So Western Greenland, for example, very topography driven, likely has orographic influences that's helping to really squeeze all the precip that it can get out of that um, feature. So um, that's probably a very long definition for an atmospheric river, but hopefully that, <laughs> and, and feel free to like uh, jump in on anything, Mark. That's all right. Just wanted to define it. I see one from Mark Seafelt coming in. In the case of the ASOS observations, how confident are you that the weather type, freezing rain, sleet rain, for example, algorithm work in the Arctic? You want to jump in, Andy? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I can give an answer, but but uh, Je Jessica um, probably has has an opinion as well on this. Um, so my answer is that that is a concern. Um, there are some of, some of the uh, present weather codes from the ASOS aren't um, uh, you know, have have been augmented by by observers. Um, I think ultimately. Um, in order to get that kind of information, we end up having to go with what with what we're provided with, but that is a concern. And um, so, one one approach um, that we can use with that is to look for um, stations with observers um, and you just compare what they what they are observing um, and, and see whether we're getting better results um, just using that subset of observations than with say using um, aut automated uh, precipitation type. But I'll, I'll, I'll let uh, Jessica answer that as, uh, as someone who's used that data. More. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, as a, as a forecaster in Juneau, Alaska, we learned to kind of take the, the observations with a grain of salt um, because there was, um, Usually, like Andy said, the, the bigger airports tend to have um, actual dedicated observers who will augment um, the hourly observation with what exactly they're seeing. So an, a human being is going in and, and putting in weather codes, whereas um, a lot of the other more isolated stations is probably relying on sensors. Um, and a lot of them probably don't have the right sensors for freezing rain or, or other complex precip types like one of the things we always kind of looked for if we saw station observations that were reporting up, which is UP, it means unknown precipitation. We generally kind of took that as it's freezing rain because um, it's the sensor has trouble detecting it. Um, it has trouble uh, figuring out exactly what it is. 
Um, so it'll a lot of times it'll put that up. So uh, every time we we were like, oh, this the station is upping, we kind of knew there was something going on. And then we also had to have an idea of what what the entire atmospheric profile looked like, because if we if we do, there was maybe some warm air coming in at a certain level. Um, we might have an idea that it might be maybe ice pellets or freezing rain um, or freezing drizzle. Uh, so we had to look at um, other resources basically in order to uh, really kind of figure out what was going on. Hey, Jessica, may I make a comment here? Yeah. Um, exactly. Following up on that same point, um, this is Jakob Putskonen. Um, as you might know, I, I've done a little bit of work on this myself some, some time back. But um, when we worked on this, uh, the, the real key was the amount of the, the rain on snow at any given event. And uh, even though there are those weather codes, they may report that there is a freezing rain, but uh, they don't. They didn't reveal how much water and how much snow. And uh, of course, a small event it didn't do much of a difference for the reindeer. Only the bigger ones were the uh, the real, real, real things. And of yeah. course, many times they didn't record any anything um, notable during the rain or snow events. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, and that's that's a, um, I guess a. Uh, what am, what am I looking for? A negative with the with the station observations is right. right. It doesn't tell you how much precipitation fell. Um, you know, we're only relying on just an observation per hour. So that may have gone through a couple of different precip changes within the hour, but we don't really quite know that. Um, and then the other aspect is like where we saw with the Western Greenland event, these very pronounced warm noses. Um, the airport observations may say it's still snowing. But observations at a higher elevation that don't have a that don't have a station um, are probably likely reporting rain or freezing rain or some type of mix. Um, so that's the other uh, aspect to watch out for too. But yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, we don't know how much rain fell. We don't know how how if it was a major or minor event in in that case with just using weather codes. But but in the case of a precipitation amount, this is where the use of multiple atmospheric reanalyses comes in. Andy, could you comment on that? Yeah. So so one of the one of the things that that we're doing is uh, not just choosing one reanalysis, but uh, using using multiple reanalyses. Um, and you know, Mark mentioned at the beginning era five, but there's also MERA two and then CFSR um, version two. So all of those, you know, hopefully have show roughly the same information, but we can use the information from that, that, that ensemble of reanalyses to small ensemble of reanalyses to, uh, to, to, Kind of provide us with with um, some extra information as well as okay. some information about uncertainty. Well, I mean, but basically, you you can use them to get some information on how big was the event in terms yes. of precipitation yeah. amount. I see what another question coming in. Uh, this is uh, from Ron Weaver, I Bill, I believe. What time? Oh, um, there was one before. Hold on, I'm looking at the one before. Came in from Ron Weaver. Uh, what hope do you have for improvement of passive microwave algorithms for precipitation differentiation? Well, to, hi, Ron. Um, to be clear, um, we're not, we're using the passive microwave data and, and hopefully some of the active microwave data not to classify the precipitation type but to indicate whether there is liquid snow or well, liquid water in the snowpack and then whether we are seeing a change in snowpack structure as a result of um, uh, refreezing um, so the, the 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 passive microwave data is to give us an idea of the snowpack characteristics rather than um, than what's happening in the atmosphere above the snowpack the the reanalysis data is is what's going to provide us with with information right. about what's happening above the snowpack yeah I mean the problem is the the uh, passive microwave tells you if there's wetness on the snow 
doesn't even necessarily tell you if it actually precipitated. It just says it's wet, right? And so it only gets you halfway home, so to speak. Uh, David Kingsmill had one. What time resolution of satellite slash active microwave remote sensing information is needed to be beneficial for the detection algorithm? Would information from the active DPR sensor on GPM be useful since it only passes a given point about twice a day? So this is going at the active microwave side of things. Or both both passive and active, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, that I think falls under um, an open research question. Um, both, both the active and the passive sensors um, there's for AM AMSA E and AMSA 2, as, as well as for SSMI, um, that there are multiple passes during during the day, um, but at, and at least two with the AM and PM um, passes. But uh, so if you notice from the uh, from the the brightness temperature um, time series, um, we're not just seeing that that instantaneous change in the, uh, thank you, not just seeing that instantaneous change in, in, um, in the brightness temperatures as a result of, of liquid water um, in, in the pack, but we're also seeing a change um, when the, that water refreezes. Um, and so there is, a, there is a temporal component here that we, that we can utilize um, to, to, to capture that. So with, with two times a day, um, uh, information two times a day, then we, we, plus kind of on subsequent days, we should be able to see whether there is that change based on looking at, at, at multiple more information from multiple passes. I do see a comment coming in here from, uh, from um, Walt Meyer regarding GPM, a combination of passive and, ra uh, passive and radar. It does a pretty good job uh, at discriminating liquid versus solid. GPM doesn't cover much of the polar regions, however, the coverage ends at about 60 degrees north latitude, I believe. So just a comment there. I do want to pick up just a couple minutes here that we do have, I believe, uh, uh, Matthew Druckenmiller is still on board. Matthew, are you still on board? Yep. Matthew. Yeah, I was wondering if you could just give us a, just a couple minutes about uh, the other components of this study that uh, that you and others, for example, our colleagues at University of Lapland are involved with, just so people know the broader aspects of this study. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, Hard, it's hard to hear you. I'm not sure what's going on. Oh, uh, one moment. Please. Any better, Mark? Oh, much better. Okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so it, admittedly, the, the aspect of our project uh, that has been looking to incorporate uh, local observations and local knowledge from community members in the Arctic and, and herders has been has been substantially delayed uh, by just our ability to to visit a lot of these uh, communities and potential partners due to COVID. Um, but we are uh, engaging with the Reindeer Herders Association in the, the, uh, the Northern Barren Sea region. There, there are still thousands of, of the reindeer that are herded in several communities. Um, and so our, our hope is, is to bring some of those herders on board to be able to not only provide observations, but to um, join in, in workshops in which we uh, focus in on what the impacts of, of rainfall during winter can be on, on, on herding practices and on communities in general. It, it's not only impacting wildlife, but it, it can it can be a, a hindrance to local transportation. Um, you know, it can provide icing on runways and, and prevent planes from coming into the communities. And so, um, as, as we in the coming years get some of these these uh, workshops planned, we also hope to bring uh, local perspectives together from across the Arctic. 
So not only working with um, communities and observers in Alaska, but also in Nunavut and Sherry. I don't know if Sherry's on the call, but Sherry has been engaging some partners there. And then Bruce Forbes and some of his colleagues are, are working with, are looking to work with, with herders in, in Finland and in, in parts of Russia. Again, they're also the kind of engagement has been delayed due to COVID. But the idea is to be able to develop a, a, a expert model on how rain and snow events impact the livelihoods of, of Arctic communities. Okay, thank you, Matthew. Yeah, it's a big study. I mean, we've got partners in Alaska and Canada, uh, Lapland, Yamal. So it's really a big project. It involves a lot of different people. Uh, we're running against our time. Uh, Ron Weaver had uh, one more. Oh, looks like we're something else. Uh, did that come from you, Matthew? Oh, from Twyla, okay. Local news headlines are shared through the LEO network, okay, and the Northern Climate Observer newsletter, right? Some of these events, of all kinds of events, right? And so she has provided a link to that, okay? So um, what I think we are heading against is our time limit. Oh, uh, Ron Weaver, if there's time for a response, I'd be interested in hearing how difficult has, it has been to bring these data sets together for analysis. And I think the answer is, it is a challenge, but we are getting there. Andy, uh, uh, Jessica, would you agree with that? Without a doubt. Yeah, it's disparate data. Uh, you know, reanalysis data is uh, nice gridded, right? But it's got issues. Station data, that's kind of your ground truth, but uh, it's sparse, there are data gaps. Uh, Local observing networks are great, right? But uh, there's this all kinds of different types of data that we're using. And it is indeed a big challenge of bringing it all together. But that's one of the big challenges of the study. That's what makes it so interesting and so fascinating is to try and pull all of this information together. For that, we are running right against our time. So I would like to thank Andy and Jessica uh, for presenting and uh, hopefully by next year, we're going to have a lot more going on and a lot more information here if we can ever get past this darn virus, right? So thank you everyone for showing up today. We'll see you again. Thank next you, Mark. Or next month or whatever.